darkness surged towards me, sucking everything loose from the ground into its depths, tugging at my clothes. I saw the flare the kidnapper had dropped and threw myself towards it just as I felt my feet lead the ground. The darkness embraced me with the force of a tornado. Somehow I managed to light the flare. The darkness roared and cast me away. I fell toward the dark waters of the lake far below. I've never been this glad to see the sunrise. I had a couple of hours to get to the coal mine. The coal mine wasn't far now. Today, I would meet the kidnapper, and he would give me Alice. I wouldn't give him any other choice. A drowning man will clutch at a straw.
Little by little, without realizing it, I'd come to believe that the story in the manuscript was coming true. The current of its narrative had taken me deeper and deeper into dark waters. Alice had been taken from me. Barry was probably in jail. I was a fugitive from the FBI. The whole world taken over by the Dark Presence was trying to destroy me. It all felt real, but it matched a textbook case of insanity. This is Pat Main, and you're listening to KBF-FM. Folks, I want to apologize for kind of abandoning you to that looping music track last night, but I was detained. You see, I encountered a big-shot G-man with an itchy trigger finger who could use a, a lesson in manners and a boot in the ass, not necessarily in that order either. Now, folks, I know I'm not being very informative here, and I apologize for that. I really should just keep quiet, but... I'm just so peeved right now, because some people just shouldn't be carrying badges. And I'm just glad that our Sheriff Breaker was there to straighten things out. And if someone I met last night is listening, let me just say, I'm sorry if my mouth got you in trouble. I'm pretty sure you're not the bad guy here. Godspeed, son. I hope you know what you're doing. Now, on a lighter note, I'll be talking to Dr. Nelson all morning. But first, a little music. Welcome back to KBF FM. Hope you enjoyed that too. Now, Doc, you were talking about life and finding that special someone, that soulmate. Well, you were talking about that. I was saying I don't buy it. Well, see, to me, that's strange because I always pegged you as a hopeless romantic. <laughs> you got me there, Pat. But I think love's where you look for it. And you need to do a lot of looking, sure. But the idea that there's that one special person out there for you, and if you miss that chance, it's gone forever, and you're forever incomplete. I mean, isn't that depressing? Or, heck, childish even? There's plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> and apparently a fisherman has a fishing analogy for everything, but what you're saying, isn't that a little harsh? Well, no. What I am saying is that your potential for finding that connection isn't limited to what's essentially a chance encounter. How is that harsh? Yeah, well, I guess that's a nice thought, but 
Let me say something personal here. Okay. Now, well, I, I don't disagree with you exactly, but I can't really fit that together with what I feel, what I, what I felt for someone, because she was the one. She was. And she... I let her drift away from me. Maybe I didn't put in the work. I don't know, but... Well, since then, and it, it was a long time ago, but, but since then, there hasn't been anyone, not like her. And I'm not saying I dwell on her or haven't moved on. I like my life. I'm not living in the past, but I do miss the way she completed me. You can't argue with the heart, Pat. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. I had kind of a scary experience last night, and let's just say it's shaken a few things loose. For Mott, spying on the writer on the ferry had been a disappointment. His boss had made Wake Out to be something special, but Mott hadn't been impressed. He'd gotten a good long look at the wife, though, and he liked what he saw. Mott had fantasized about goading Wake into a fight, but it hadn't happened. Still, he'd get his chance to see if the writer had anything in him. He'd been promised as much. I was early. I was supposed to meet the kidnapper at noon in the main building. The coal mine was quiet. It was a museum now. With Nightingale gone and the night wind blowing in through the broken studio window, Maine stared at Sarah. The sheriff looked away. Maine's voice shook with barely controlled anger. That boy's doing more drinking than thinking. I hope you know what you're doing, Sarah. He's got a sickness in his eyes. You take my word for it. He wants Wake for a reason, and it's not for anything good. I didn't want to go outside. Cops had to be looking for me. The noon sun turned the place into a sauna. The day dragged on. 
different scenarios ran through my mind. Ways of how I'd torture the kidnapper to get Alice back, or the different horrible things he could have done to her. I imagined her dead. I had no way of knowing she was still alive. It was killing me. I was running on blind hope. It was all a waste of time. The bastard never showed up. Wake! Where the hell are you? Change of plans! You know where Mirror Peak is? It's a big mountain north of where you are. You follow the path from the mine, you can't miss it. There's a lookout point there. I'll be waiting. I'm through being jerked around you by you. You see your wife alive? Because if you do, you better watch what you say to me. Do we understand each other? I want to talk to Alice. Yeah, and I want the manuscript. Don't keep me waiting, Wake. Hello? Hello? Ah! Uh, I'm gonna kill him! I had to get to Mirror Peak. Maybe closer than ever before. When Thomas Zane fell for Barbara Jagger, it happened fast. She was young, vibrant and beautiful, full of life. He had never been a very happy man, and without any seeming effort, she had changed all that. Zane felt good for the first time in his life. Everything she did was another piece of a jigsaw puzzle he hadn't even known he'd been missing. And best of all, she made the words flow, strong and sharp. She was his muse.
The only way to reach the hillside ahead was to go through the building. I had to find a way to avoid electrocution. Some of the Taken retained echoes of their former selves, but these were just the nerve twitches of a dead thing. Nothing remained but a shell covered and filled with darkness. In most cases, these puppets were enough for the purposes of the Dark Presence. But for anything more elaborate, as with the writer, it was different. It needed his mind. And so rather than taking him over completely, it merely touched him.
There was no way the flashbang grenades were standard power company equipment. I stared through the bars of the jail cell. Barry stood behind me, swaying on his feet, looking as ill as I felt. Agent Nightingale stood on the other side of the bars with Sheriff Breaker. Nightingale had a stack of manuscript pages in his hand. He seemed unhinged as he gloated. Well, I've got you now, Raymond Chandler. It's all here, all the evidence, including conspiracy to murder a federal agent.
I had no real plan. I was going to give the kidnapper all the manuscript pages I had for Alice. If that wasn't enough, I'd hold him at gunpoint and make him talk. dark presence was moving ahead of me in the same direction I was going. A cold feeling settled itself in the pit of my stomach. Was it going for Alice? The place was dead, a ghost town. Had been for decades, maybe a century. Things were never as simple in real life as in fiction. I had lost count of the times I had wished there'd be a clear reason for my writer's block. Something to fight. Something to lash out on. There wasn't. I was filled with doubt. I was nothing like the hero in my books. 
Alex Casey had gone through his life with single-minded determination, never wavering from his goal. Even now, I was angry at myself, angry at Alice, angry at Barry. I was fumbling and I had no plan. Outside of riding is a struggle. I feel ill. I managed to make my way downstairs. There's a shoebox filled with books and papers by Thomas Zane. It's very hard to focus, but I managed to read some of it. He's a poet, and a good one. He writes of muses and creators summoning fabulous things from a magic lake, using his powers to shape the world of a realm of gods and dreams and demons, dark things that wait for a chance to slip through, wearing the flesh of men as disguise. Zane writes about himself, his girlfriend being taken over by a dark presence, about growing scared of the lake. Zane believes it's a mirror to the gaping void of darkness above, where some Lovecraftian presence lurks. I crawl back upstairs. I'll borrow these things from my story. They ring true. They fit.
The kidnapper had sent me a text. The message was full of spelling errors and insults. It was telling me to hurry up. Even behind the closed doors and curtains of his grimy room at the Majestic, the local motel, Nightingale could feel the locals' eyes on him, the unrelenting pressure of their judgment. He forced it out of his mind. For all he knew, they could all be under Wake's spell already. You do what you have to do to get the job done. He took comfort from the bottle in his hand. Please, he thought. Just let me get through this. <laughs> 